This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Hey, Mayor, welcome back. Good to be back. Yeah, uh, I'm sure everybody will be very happy to have you back on the podcast. Uh, so, yeah, Mayor went on uh, on a short hiatus since November. Uh, as as our listeners will know, uh, he's he's now the f- proud father of a young boy. How's life as a dad? It's very satisfying. And at the same time, this was the most difficult winter of my life. <laughs> so I uh, spent a lot of time looking after the infant. And I also managed to launch two validators, one on Loom and one on Cosmos uh, this winter. But it's been heads down a lot of work on both fronts. <laughs> but the spring's really nice, you know. Uh, Uh, The infants grown up really well. The validators have come out really well. We had a lot of delegations. And so it's one of the happiest springs that I've... And and of course, like the token prices have recovered. So it's one of the happiest springs I've had in in a while. That's good. Yeah. After a long winter of... uh... Yeah, uh, probably like sleepless nights and and uh, and long days of working and putting out validators and um, yeah, I guess now you get uh, the fruits of that uh, labor or you know sleeplessness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and now now I get to experience the fruits of that labor. Yeah, <laughs> great. So yeah, we're happy to happy to have you back on. I'm sure everybody will also be happy to. Uh, have you back on episodes uh, once in a while. Um, so today we're speaking with Simon de la Rouvier, uh, who is, well, it's a lot of things. So, I mean, Simon's been around the space for quite some time. He was one of the first employees at Consensus. He's a co-founder at Ujo, uh, which is a music platform uh, that was that spun out of Consensus. Um, and Simon has been doing a lot of writing over the years about all kinds of things. I mean, in the early days in like 2014, he was writing about Bitcoin and more recently has been doing a lot of writing around, um, tokens, uh, also was one of the people who, um, was part of the original spec of the ERC 20 tokens. So he's been doing a lot of work about a lot of, a lot of thinking around tokens for quite some time. And, and more recently has been writing and speaking a lot about token curated registries uh, and um, in continuous organizations and all kinds of topics that kind of gravitate around uh, token curated registries. And so we talked to Simon about a lot of those things and explore some of the economics there. And uh, yeah, it was a fascinating conversation. Um, before we go to that interview, I did want to mention one thing that uh, I've been working on recently that I started to work on and I would really, really like some help and contributions from uh, our listeners and our community. A couple of weeks ago, I started thinking about, hey, it would be great if Epicenter would have a Wikipedia page and um, started doing a bit of writing and writing some of the uh, origin story around Epicenter and how Brian and I met uh, back in twenty, like late 2013 uh, and the LTB contest. So uh, our early listeners will know about this, uh, about this story, and uh, and also you know how Meher and Sunny and Federica came to the show, and uh, started putting that into a, a draft Wikipedia article. And so I've been, I spent a little bit of time sort of digging through old episodes and digging get, digging up quotes and things like that to have proper citations. And um, I would be really grateful if. Uh, some of you out there, if you have some time and kind of remember those days and maybe uh, you know could cite some references, go in and uh, contribute to the draft Wikipedia article. Uh, and so you can get to it uh, pretty easily by going to, I've got a short link for you, epicenter.rocks slash wiki 
So if you go to that URL, you'll be taken straight to the draft uh, page for that article. And then there's also another article that is in draft um, that you can find by scrolling down and it is uh, a list of Epicenter episodes. And um, so I think once the, um, you know, if and once the uh, actual Wikipedia article gets approved at some point in the future, then we can put out the, um, we can also suggest to, to have the episode list released. And um, yeah, so we'd be really happy and really, really great if, if uh, people out there could uh, contribute to that. So without further delay, here is our interview with Simon de la Rivière. So we're here today with Simon de la Rivière. Hi, Simon. Hi there. I don't know if, if you usually pronounce your name so so French. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is honestly the first time someone's pronounced it like that, even though uh, it is a very French name. I'm actually not French. Uh, all, like my ancestors 200 years ago, they, they spoke French. Um, but it's the first time I actually heard it like that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't know how to pronounce it any other way. But um, <laughs> yeah. thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, pleasure. Uh, yeah, please tell us, tell us a bit about your background and how you got involved in the blockchain space. Uh, I've always been a programmer and interested in just building interesting things, tinkering and so forth. And um, I first got involved in the blockchain space in 2011. Um, I found Bitcoin by just browsing the internet and thought this was really interesting. Um, it still piqued my interest after two weeks and then I thought it like, I need to pay attention. This is really interesting. Um, but then I only stayed as a hobbyist. Um, I was still a student st um, studying. Um, and then in 2013, um, when this experiment still didn't die, I, I, it seemed to become more and more important in the back of my head. So I, I started checking in more fully. Um, and so back then I started actually working in the Bitcoin space, building side projects, um, my first side projects, projects back then, um, to actually starting to look at the code of Bitcoin itself. Um, and then while I was finishing my master's degree, um, I, I actually started building applications for it. Um, and then in 2014, when um, I, I managed to save up some money um, to work full time in the space, uh, I didn't know if it was too early, but I was just really excited to experiment. Um, and so I, I built my own altcoins, I forked, forked it, I commit, committed some code back to Bitcoin. I just had a lot of fun um, playing around and experimenting with what was available back then. Um, seeing that things were like really tough, and considering that I was a programmer and it was tough for me, I was just very excited when Ethereum came around and actually promised ideologically and technically to be more friendly to developers. Um, I, I wanted to join as easy as early as I can. Um, and so back then, um, through through luck and being online, um, one of the first ploys of consensus found me. Um, and then I joined in January 2015. Um, as one of the first employees at Consensus, working and building and developing Ethereum applications. Um, over the course of the four years, I've worked on various projects from um, co-founding Uja Music, which created one of the first smart contract royalty payments in the music industry, to inventing um, new kinds of economics. Um, I helped co-design the ERC-20 standard um, and started the first smart contract security best practices um and now today uh i am just back in tinkering mode uh, after four years of consensus and uja music um just playing around and still reading still writing still trying to catch up with everything that's happening in the space there's a lot of stuff so you've done a lot in in the space of the last four or five years uh, when did you start to see this intersection between blockchain technology and art and music and economics? I guess it comes from my background. Um, I, I was always interested in, um, in creating things. Um, I, I, I've been a musician for a long while. I've always enjoyed writing. And being from South Africa, I've experienced what it's like being in a developing country and having to interact with the internet and not necessarily having access to certain services. So when those things converge, I was like, this is a really interesting economics experiment. It is computer science and it actually provides access where people like me haven't had access before. This is exciting. I need to pay attention. Um, so it has it, been coming from a different while. My master's degree 
For example, it was a completely unrelated field. I was studying information overload on social media, um, which actually did inform some of my ideas later on. But so it, it has always been a constellation of things that have interested me. And you know, when I looked at the blockchain and when I looked at Bitcoin, there was this promise of, of just empowerment and I could participate. Uh, I didn't have to fly to Silicon Valley to participate. Like I could be in my bedroom in South Africa and participate. So it just was really exciting. Of course, Simon, like you've been one of the earliest team members at Consensus. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it was employee number six. Yeah. You were employee number six. And of course, you have recently left Consensus two mm-hmm. months back. And how many people does Consensus have now? Um, I, I think it's still hovering around a thousand people around there, give or take. Yeah. So you've seen this company go from six people to a thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was the journey like? How, like? how has consensus changed from the time it, it was so tiny into now this largest company in the Ethereum space? I mean, it was, it is a super fascinating journey just because as well, you know, I, I tried creating my own startups when I left university and I, I didn't get off the ground. So in, in more ways than one, this was my first like job experience and I put it in quotation marks because I don't think it's like a, what people would equate to being a normal job experience, having worked at consensus. And I put, I put that in a good way. Um, it, it, there was a lot of freedom that we, we could do uh, um, many things, a lot of autonomy. So it was like a, just a, a really great experience to going from university, start trying to start things into an environment like that where I could just experiment and, and create things. And I think that was also the intention early on, is just to say, like, we need to build this new market and actually we have no idea what's necessary. So do what you think is necessary. Do, do what you would do if you, if you had an open weekend and you just wanted to tinker. And that was really great initially. Um, but, like, the, the way the company grew, it grew very, very quickly and for me, it was just like, I was just trying to make sure I'm learning as much as possible why this is happening because this is my first, like, rodeo, so to speak. It's like, I just want to learn, how do you run a company? How do you manage people? Like, how do you do finances? And then Joe Lubin just comes and starts hiring so many people. And and I just got to learn from so many people. Um, even at, like, 30 people, I sort of, like, learned from people to a 1,000 people. There was still so many people I could learn from. And you know, me being someone that's interested in many things, it was just hard to eventually say no to stuff. It's like, okay, I have I have to get out of these 2,000 Slack channels. This is, I, I'm not actually getting to my work. Um, but it was just interesting to see a change over time and, and how a company like that deals with certain organizational stresses as it grows, uh, growing pains and so forth. That, you know, ended up being valuable lessons. But it was a, a journey I wouldn't, um, it, it was definitely one of, the best experiences I've had so far in my life, for sure, to be a part of that. So during this journey, you co-founded Ujo Music. And uh, of course, Ujo started off as the project that sought to change the way like royalties are split up uh, when an artist creates a piece of music and ultimately is distributed. So uh, give a sense of Ujo's journey uh, what was the original plan? What you ended up building, and where that startup is at today? Yeah. So it, early on in consensus, we again there was just this sense of sort of Cambrian explosion of possibility. We, it's like we, there's so much to explore. We have to try everything, and so the, a lot of the early projects were just because it was people initially interested in these things. Like Truffle was started by Tom Coulter because he wanted to build an Ethereum dApp and he felt it sucked, so he started Truffle. Um, same for me, I'm a musician. I always looked at the problems of musicians. And um, back then there was a, another guy that also joined the team, Phil Barry. And we looked at the music industry and realized there's opportunity here. Um, and um, one, Imogen Heap at that time started seeing the same promise. and. We got in touch with her and said, "Like, look, let, let's do something. Let's create this experiment just to prove that it's possible." Um, and so we got working, built the prototype in two months. And back then, I think October 2015, this was one of the first DApps that came out. And so, you know, we even had to 
experiment with user experience. We had like a light wallet, like MetaMask didn't exist back then. And we weren't going to tell people to go use Mist or sync their own nodes and whatever. Um, so we had to run our own nodes and keep everything running. It was one of the first oracles because we had to put the Ethereum US dollar price as well in there. Um, so it was a fun experiment. Later on, um, she didn't end up selling any of the ethers she made because it's like $1 was one ether and she sold like a bunch of songs at one dollar which actually those funds went into actually supporting her recent tour which is great news for us because like at least we helped one artist make a living um and over time um we went sort of back to drawing board researched the music industry and discovered there's just so many problems and a blockchain can solve a lot of these problems in different manner but we had to pick like, what are we good at? What do we care about? What does the music industry need? And so we went in different ways for a long time, just building technology, throwing technology away, um, asking many more questions, and then eventually led itself to, to building today what is the Ujo portal, where musicians can upload music, they own the rights, uh, metadata is created um, that, that represents the music, and they can be paid. 100% um, of the music, 100% of the royalties goes to them, and it's split according to who is ever, whomever is um, a part of the collaboration that made the music. Um, so that, that's been the course over the past few years in Ujo. I, I think the hardest thing just have been getting the, 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 the music industry really likes the blockchain, but it's actually really hard in practice to like get people on board. Um, and that's been just the hardest thing. Also, just bumping up into the legal issues of copyright and intellectual property and how the blockchain works with that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not easy problems. So how did all of this lead you uh, to become interested in things that we're going to talk about today, which are um, continuous organizations, token-created registries, etc.? I mean, f for me, I, I saw Ujo Music and curation markets and all these new kind of crypto economic models as two ways to solve the same problem or two different ways to solve the same problem and that is I was always focused on like the creator uh, how do we ensure that people can continue creating the things they create and like are there transaction costs we can reduce um, are there new ways to build new economic models to build more things to create more things and to create communities around these things. So Ujo Music was on the one hand a way to do that in the music industry, to say, how are we reducing the transaction costs for musicians to make a living, reduce the cost of licensing, uh, reduce the cost of the metadata problem in the music industry. And then the other side is the creation markets, which is, let's create new economies. Uh, let's allow people to do things, new things in new ways. And that's how it, it was always like a, a tennis match between the two for me is like some days I would spend more time thinking about curation markets, some days I would spend more time about the real problems in the music industry. Um, so that it happened in parallel. So of course, uh, over the past couple of, over the past three or four years, uh, I've, I've followed your blog and your blog pioneered a lot of ideas that ultimately many teams picked up on and they built their projects based on their ideas, right? The first idea was the idea of a bonding curve. The second was the idea of a curation market. And then very recently, you've had, um, you've had ideas around how, how artists can create artworks um, and get paid for their artworks while other people can own their artworks and unique models thereof. So it would be interesting for us to go into kind of your journey making all of these inventions and trying to get a sense of what these inventions solve and where you feel, where you found practical success with, uh, with these inventions. So uh, maybe the first thing we could start with is the idea of the bonding curve. And um, could you explain to us what a bonding curve is and what kind of economic interaction it, it seeks to be? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I've, I've tried this a few times before, um, and it's always an experiment to also explain it in new different ways. So let me give this a go. Um, a bonding curve is essentially... Uh, 
it stems from the desire to create a continuous token model um, as opposed to an ICO. So um, if people want a token for a specific purpose, a smart contract is the automatic pricing and the provider of liquidity. And so how it works is if you have one Ether, you bond it into the smart contract and based on the current price that the smart contract sets in a hard-coded manner, it would mint a new token. Um, and this, which is why it's called the bonding curve, because it would generally change based on the supply of the tokens in circulation. That's why it looks like a curve. It could either be linear, exponential, or logarithmic. Um, and then over time, once there's this pot has grown, there's more tokens in circulation, anyone at any time can then sell their tokens back for a part of this reserve or deposit or pool that has been built up by people buying the token. So it's this, this mental model of a ecosystem growing and shrinking based on demand for the specific token and the price of the token will differ based on if there's demand for the token. If, if a lot of people want it, the price will be higher. If no, if fewer people want it, the price will be lower. And you can buy and sell at any point along this sort of curve. So the idea here is like there's a smart contract and that smart contract controls a pool of ether. Uh, we can think of ether first, maybe, maybe die later. And there is a creator of that smart contract like that deploys this smart contract. The smart contract starts with zero ether. And it and this smart contract has uh, the rights to mint a certain token. Right? This token could be could be any token. Hmm. So let's say like these are like Simon tokens. So Simon goes and deploys the smart contract, it starts with zero ether, but zero Simon tokens issued. And then, and then the smart contract has an open entry mechanism. So anyone can deposit Ether into the smart contract and get a bunch of Simon tokens. Yeah. Maybe in the beginning, so if I'm the first person to deposit uh, Ether, it might be the case that I deposit one Ether and I get 100 Simon tokens. And then like the second person, Sebastian, comes along and deposits one Ether, but he doesn't get 100, he gets 90. He gets less than I did. Yes, yeah. So the smart contract, in a sense, incentivizes early deposits into the early deposits of ether into this contract, and then as as more ether gets accumulated, um, it might mint lesser and lesser tokens in the future. And this idea that the number of tokens minted per ether uh, depends on the total number of ether inside that contract. So you can you can plot these two things, and that is a mathematical curve, which is why you call this a bonding curve. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, like you can see that this is a smart contract that will end up accumulating ether, and then issuing a bunch of uh, project tokens. When I saw this model in the first, uh, the first time, my fundamental question was like, as as a person wanting to create a token, I usually want access to the ether that got collected, right? Like normally, if you look at an ICO, right? Cosmos Project did an ICO. Yeah, yeah. So they collected a bunch of ether, they gave out tokens, but then they want to use this ether in order to build some system. Mm -hmm. But like this bonding curve design that you that you came up with they didn't have this other mechanism. There wasn't a central team that was collecting the ether and channeling it towards the development of some system. Why? Why remove that aspect? It initially, especially the early designs, was around just finding a way for people to commit to some cost. In this case, the opportunity cost to lock up your ether. Um, for minting some token that represents a community of value. Uh, and it depends what the token will be used for. The initial example that I had was people would take this token and then um, stake this token to, in, to information and that, thus create a curation market. As in like, it, you would be able to create topic tokens like, you know, um, Ethereum as a topic or football as a topic or um, 
gardening as a topic and whatever, but it was just a way to price how valuable the information was. And so it wasn't necessary to develop anything. You know, it wasn't necessary that the funds would need to be used for investing in infrastructure or investing in people or be used in un any other manner besides just a commitment scheme. Like I'm undergoing opportunity costs and that is a signal to the rest of community that I want to put some value where I want it to be and it's a pricing mechanism to do that. Um, so initially it was just that the pool would be just that, uh, that the money would not never flow out for additional purposes, but there has been people that have been building uh, alternative designs where the ether doesn't just stay in, the, in there. It, it can be become fungible outside of that pool. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS, and half that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. In some senses, like when you look at many societies, like societies, cults, religions, there are many times that these societies have, you know, like entry costs. So you might have you might have a cult. You can enter, anyone can enter, but in order to enter, they have to undergo this ceremony. And like this ceremony is maybe it's expensive in some way, maybe it's painful in some way, like different, you know, like these societies, cults, they're also ways to coordinate people. But they create an, an entry cost, and the entry cost is not necessarily in order to create a pool of capital that the organization will use. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is in essence to have some kind of signaling cost that whoever came into the organization paid a price to, to come in. Yes, absolutely. And therefore, and therefore they are committed to the, to the cause. Right? So in a sense, like this is like the blockchain equivalent of, of, of that system where Anyone can enter, but in order to enter, you'll have to part with your Ether. Yeah. And when you part with your Ether, you get your project token. Those Ether won't, will stay in the contract. They're not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and you can, you can, you can see that on the blockchain that the Ether are not are right there. You have, you have certainty over, over that. So this is sort of an entry mechanism. Then how, what's the exit mechanism? How do I? exit this group of people it, it depends again like it in the sort of most simplest version of a token bonding curve is you can exit at any time like because there's always a pool of collateral in the smart contract and if the price is zero there's zero collateral you know but when the price is a hundred there might be you know a hundred ether in there or or 20 ether or 30 ether it depends on the, obviously the 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 supply curve um so people can exit at any time. And the reason why they would exit is depending on the use case of the token and whether it's still value, valuable for them and or whether it the price has increased to such an extent that it becomes too profitable for them to not exit. So, you know, let's say we put tokens together and it's for this community and this token means you can have access to certain services. Now, suddenly there's so much demand that that you bought it because you just wanted to get access to services. But now the demand is so much that you bought 100 tokens early on and now it's suddenly worth a few cars. And you go like, well, I don't, I don't need this much anymore for access to these services. I will sell a bit 
to get back some of my return and maybe even make a profit or a reward, additional reward for having participated in some form. Um, but alternatively, like if you get in while the community is thriving and it starts to decay for whatever reason, then it might be that when you sell your token, you might get less back than you put in. But that's like the normal sort of like growing and shrinking of value that you find in various forms from company stocks to um, currencies and whatever. So it, it the first and foremost thing is, do I want to participate because this is valuable for me? Then you would enter. If you would then leave with no value, then you would have still gained something because you, you were there first and foremost for getting access to something or participating in a community or just having the token for whatever reason you want to. How does that lead us then to the next topic, which is curation markets? Um, maybe by starting with describing what is a curation market. Mm. Sure. Um, so for me, a, a curation market is a way of using it's like a subset of crypto economics that is specifically about the curation of information. Um, and whether that is for, hey, like look at this new funny meme or we need to figure out what is important for this DAO. Like we need to curate a list of topics and issues that we need to discuss in the next monthly call. So it's, it is a very broad description of various information that need to be curated. Um, and so curation mark has always been like, okay, how do we use crypto economics to, to, to make it easier for people to make decisions and or share information with each other that is novel, whether it's a new book or a meme or whatever. Um, and so curation markets to me currently contains many of these crypto economic primitives, like one of them being token bonding curves. And I primarily put these crypto economic primitives into two buckets, especially in curation markets into continuous staking games. And that is token bonding curves where you would have a liquid price based on something or a ranking. Like many token bonding curves would result in some ranking system based on different weights or value that's being staked. Um, then on the other hand, um, this is a tongue twister, but I like to call it as staked slashing shelling games. But it's essentially saying people put up some money towards something and they're willing to be proved wrong or right. And then in return, they either lose their stake or they gain additional funds. And that is what a TCR is or a token curated registry. Like people are saying, I want to be a part of this list. I'm willing to put up some money to say that I'm a reputable participant. Um, and you guys need to now vote whether I that is the case or not. Um, so it's like two diff different forms in that sense. And people have started mixing this in various different ways um, currently. And so it, it is still like a, a topic that, that is being explored in many ways. Is it right to say that First, you came up with the idea of the bonding curve. So, a way to... So, essentially, like... So, when I visited, like, DevCon in the DevCon in London, this was, I think, 2015. This, this was when you were working on the ERC-20 standard. Right? Yeah. This was... Uh, so, you had a presentation on tokens, 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 and then... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> after that, present, shortly after that presentation came the ERC-20 standard. Yes. And so the natural question is, of course, so you can have a traditional token, which is, oh, I created this token, and then I sold this token, and I raised a bunch of money, and I did this. So that's the normal ICO. But of course, of course, like this, this technology is really general. So you don't need to subscribe to that model. So you came up with this model that, hey, we can, we can create a bunch of token holders by this novel mechanism of depositing Ether and allowing these token holders to withdraw the Ether. And then we can have these tokens and these, these communities. And so that was the first idea. Now, of course, there comes a second question, which is like, okay, what can these communities do once they have this token? Mm. And then curation markets are sort of your proposal on what these communities can do, that these communities can curate information. Yeah, it's, it's, it's saying like in, in order for us to work together across the globe in curating information that also adds economic signals to it 
or new, at least new signals, a proof of something that this is valuable information. Um, then curation marks is, is a way for people to agree that whatever economic game is being played here and the resulting information is valuable to us um, or meaningful. Um, and, and what you currently see in the web is that you know, we, we, we know the web today is an abundant web. There's a lot of information out there um, and a lot of misinformation out there. If we start saying, we, we want to know what we, like, what we see has been built up and shared by these sort of economic principles, like, like who has been incentivized to share us this information? That's the kind of questions we want to know. It's like, we want like organic free range information. We want transparency in how the information got to us. And if there is a transparent economic game that produced some information, we at least there is, we know the participants involved and their motives to, to give us that information. Um, so that that's sort of how these kind of crypto economic games would hopefully result in this kind of outcomes, in these kind of outcomes. It's at least like more transparent information with more clear incentives involved. Can, can you describe maybe an example of a curation market in, in its simplest form or one that some people might be able to relate to? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the simplest one is maybe the, the original design that I had, which is you have this this bonding curve, which is there is a community of people, they're excited about football, okay? So they they want to share memes around football and relevant information, whatever is novel to them. And so people say, okay, but we also want to participate in sharing the value in the job that we've been doing in curating this information. Um, so what people do is and say, okay, I'm going to put up some Ether, I'm going to buy some football tokens, and now it's like, great, we need to now curate this information. I have some football tokens. Then you can take those football tokens and stake it to a item, uh, a link that, you know, look at this great goal that happened this weekend by this Premier League match. Um, if more people stake to that link, the higher it is in this list. And thus it is a novel um, information that you think is relevant to that community. And if the information is curated well, it will attract more participants that want to participate because you're also creating a community at the same time where when you have a football token, it is a signal to say, I care about this topic. And if if it's just like, um, if you go to a music concert, um, if you the, the cost to buy a ticket is already a, a way for you to start having conversations with people there because you know what the topic will be about. Hey man, have you listened to the new album? So that's the kind of process that is put online in a way for a community to interact with each other. Um, so over time, this list will change up and down. It's, it's like if you were able to add economic um, incentives to Reddit, you know, that, that's, that's, that's some of the, the earliest designs. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that, that kind of looks a little bit like Reddit and the way that popular content kind of rises to the top. So I, I guess this is sort of related, but you've, you've de described, uh, you, you've talked about, uh, creation markets and its relevance to memes quite a bit in your writing. Can you elaborate on why you think these two concepts are somehow inter intertwined? Uh, just to preface, um, when I used the word memes originally, it was to reference it to the original definition of the word, which is to just represent a cultural unit of information. So it it is basically all encapsulated information, like ether, like just words and ideas and things. But obviously, memes as we know them became to be known as like dank internet memes, like the funny dogs and what whatnot. So speaking to that, it is when we look at the way people are sharing information now today, um, there is this feeling of there being this, you know, quote unquote, a curation market for meme or a meme market. Um, you know, there would be memes that are suddenly popular and then go away. Uh, it's like, it's, it's in, essence, in essence, like people are trading memes, so to speak. But it would be interesting if there was just a way in which people can actually make a return on actually contributing to this commons. Like, we're all sharing this, these memes. And if you make a funny meme, yes, you might get a few retweets on Twitter, but that's about it. Like, if, but you actually contributed some good to people's lives by making a viral 
inter internet meme. So the one of the earlier goals was to say this can actually be used for people to become quote unquote meme traders, right? And that was like one of the earlier ideas I had. And coincidentally, this was extremely serendipitous, but exactly that there was a blog post that came out which I made that first idea and said like, look, we can have meme markets, people can trade internet memes. Literally on the same day was the day that the Reddit's meme economy subreddit was created. And in and Reddit's meme economy subreddit, they're jokingly doing this now still. And there's hundreds of thousands of people that are jokingly trading memes. They're saying, hot new format, buy, buy, buy. You know, it's like hot new Elon memes coming out. This is going to be the stock of the summer. You know, and so and it's going, oh no, like sell the Joe Biden memes. It's it's not cool anymore. Like it's so people are jokingly doing this anyway. And I feel like there's such a interesting market where people can actually they're participating in this for just having fun, but if they can actually make money, then it, I, I always imagine this weird future where my kids one day would be meme tr meme traders, just having fun with themselves and making money on the side. Um, but that that's that's part of that vision was something like that. And there there was a team that actually built a version of it. It was called Meme Lords. Um, it it is live on Ringby. Um, and people have been trading memes on there, having fun. Uh, I'm not sure how much it's used now, but I've been poking the team to put it live to mainnet, so we ac we can actually see what the ec economics looks like in practice. Don't you worry that a mechanism like that will, in the end, become gamed? Because, so so when like you created the football tokens, right? Um, maybe initially the people that enter they will be the people that are actually interested in football tokens because right now um, right now the community doesn't exist and maybe initially the curation is really uh, is valuable but once there is this financial incentive hey i can i can enter and i can curate and then one day more people will enter and then because more people will enter the the sort of price will rise. Uh, the price of a football token will rise. And I'll, I'll have a bunch of football tokens and I can burn them and I can exit and I can make a few ether. Yeah. Uh, doesn't this start to attract the kind of person that you don't want? Like uh, the person that's there in order to make a bunch of ether, not really curate really good information on football. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in its in its simplest forms, I think there's there's a lot of um, possibility for participants to get involved that aren't necessarily aligned with the goals of the experiment um, or the community. Uh, you can have like rampant speculation just ruining the community and its value that it's created amongst each other. You can people will absolutely be be fleeced out of money uh if 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 just those simple versions exist I, especially if people don't necessarily understand what they're getting themselves into um it is there's definitely ripe and possible for people to be exploited in various ways and i think a lot of the research since since these original ideas were published were okay how do we mitigate some of this like how do we avoid you know rampant speculation but still having the value of buying and participating if, for example, the Ocean Protocol team recently published stuff on how to do short selling on um, uh, bonding curves, which would allow just the price volatility to be mitigated somewhat. Um, so that that's one solution. Um, so there's different ways people have come forth to to combat this. In, in general, though, I mean, it the, the the primary purpose is a way to people and to empower themselves by creating these new communities but then having this new way of distributing trust among themselves that is also valuable. And it is possible, though, that this could be ex exploited in many ways in the future, including the fact that, you know, what if this is so successful that that is what we do with our daily lives? Like, this this is so important and so valuable wealth generation that we be all become meme traders. And I don't think that's necessarily a world that we want either. I, I do also think, though, that, yes, 
although some of these ideas are exploitable in some sense, I think it's important to understand the scale of what's necessary or what should be involved. Like Vitalik recently published actually a blog post on collusion and bribing in these kind of curation market games, which absolutely exists. He, he made a very good blog post. But I think what's important to consider is um, to what extent to what extent are we going to scale these things? If you're going to have an economy of football tokens that is worth billions, you're absolutely going to attract people that's going to exploit the ec economics. But if it's a bunch of people, like 2,000 people across the world that is working together to create this community of value for amongst themselves, the economics doesn't have to be so foolproof. And we've seen that that's the case in blockchain in general. Um, there's a lot of cryptocurrency projects out there that don't need the security of Bitcoin mining, but they still provide value for themselves. So it, it doesn't have to be foolproof, it just has to be good enough. And as the community grows, then perhaps the economics could scale, you know, that the economics could scale to protect people um, over time. Um, because you also don't want to put up too many barriers to entry when people start. So that it is a very interesting topic and I think people will experiment. I think at the end of the day also user experience will just be so important as well. People need to understand what they're doing. Um, they need to feel like they're in control. They're, they're empowered. Um, and that is still an open blank canvas that people need to work on. So yeah. So essentially like I, I, I'm able to visualize uh, how this would look like. So to, to me, to me, the, ultimate end user product is something like a reddit so right now we have all of these reddits on these different topics and uh, reddit really doesn't have an economic mechanism if i am if i'm a reddit user i can go and upvote stuff in any subreddit yeah um, and ultimately like people upvote in these subreddits and it uses these upvotes in order to have a list of interesting content items other people go and see these content items so the difference the difference here would be if there's a particular curation market, so the curation market is like a subreddit, it's a football curation market. If I actually want my upvote to matter, then I must deposit Ether, get these football tokens, and then upvote. And somehow the strength of my upvote is linked to the number of football tokens I have. And then there are other people with these football tokens and their... Um, all of their upvotes with these differing strengths are used to, you know, populate the, the Reddit. And so you can have football tokens, you can have basketball tokens, you can have like thousands of these tokens and you can power a decentralized Reddit that way. Um, so if, if I am a user, like let's say I'm interested in football, there are a couple of different utilities for me. The first utility would be I can get football tokens right now and if the community of football tokens grows, I can exit at a later point in time and I can make money. That's one yeah, kind of utility. Yeah. Second kind of utility is you know, the belongingness to a community. Uh, Absolutely. We, are, we all have these football tokens and we are curating this football ready together. The third, of course, is if I'm also producing content related to football, I would want my content to be prominent in this in this football reddit so therefore if i'm a content producer i want some football tokens so i'm able to effectively advertise my content into this subreddit yeah yeah so so effectively this interaction of depositing ether getting football tokens satisfies um these desires of mine which is why and if there are many people that have these desires then actually a design like that could run this design has been around for two years Yet we don't have a Reddit-like product that works that way. What do you think is the chasm? Why, why does it not happen? Well, I mean, the, the, the closest one would be to, to say, like, let's look at Steemit, because um, it, it, it also has this economy where you're, you're, you're putting up um, it's this curation game with token economics involved. But it is not community-specific. Um, and I think that that's the difference. I think I think the biggest thing is is that it, it for example, well, I haven't personally tried it. It's just because like I, it's just there's just like a lot of variation of the ideas, and I, currently I just enjoy exploring what's possible, and and writing and re and researching still. Um, 
I think user experience is hard. It's going to be hard for people to understand what's going on um, and, and whether it's meaningful to use the blockchain in, in this manner. So there's, there's a lot of open-ended questions. I think the closest one is um, uh, Slava's Relevant. Relevant is an application which, which is similar to this, uh, where you have this prediction game using bonding curves. Um, on posts, but they have one thing which mitigates somewhat the speculation, which is there is a concept of reputation. So um, if you have been an active participant, then um, your the it, it as far as I understand it, your reputation would also affect the the ranking of the posts along with its sort of economic weighting, um, or, or at least the each other, it would support each other. So I think it's just early days currently um, for people to experiment with this. Um, my When these ideas were first created, the interesting response was that seeing that actually a lot of people were more focused on just these concepts being used at a protocol level rather than a user-facing level at this stage. That's why it's like a core part of, say, Ocean Protocol or um, other projects using this. And in essence, it might be some form of economics that just disappears from the user. As in, you would just be interacting on Reddit, you wouldn't know what's happening, but you put up some funds and it, it has been buying and selling stuff for you. And if you've been making, producing value for people, then you would just find that your wallet has increased. You've made some money, um, so it it will depend. I, I think we'll we'll still see what uh, how it works in the future. Earlier, you mentioned token curated registries. Uh, let's dive into that a little bit. So, uh, I think I think it's a better term than a stake slashing shelling game. Uh, it's <laughs> actually much easier to say. So, let's focus on on a, on the TCRs for a little bit uh, and, yeah, and describe. Sure. Because that kind of describes it, like the stake slashing selling game. Of course, like you know, you, you obviously yeah. understand what's happening here. But let's let's dive in a little deeper. So, I mean, t token curated registries. When I first read the paper f um, from I mean Mike and James, um, it, it was very interesting to me because I, I, me working on my own set of ideas around curation markets at the time, saw this and realized, whoa, hang on. I think the space is much broader than what I've just been thinking on. Like we can do different, a lot of different games and permutations to produce valuable or novel information for whomever is interested. Um, but you know, for those who don't know, a token curated registry is a is a primarily a sort of binary information game, which is you apply to be part of a list and it, the current list participants, its token holders, would then either vote for you to be in or out. And in order for you to be in and remain in, you have to put up a deposit in that list's tokens. Um, and the participants that are doing the voting would be rewarded for voting correctly, or correctly meaning which way the vote will go. So there's a, it's a simple curation game that ideally incentivizes people to accept valuable participants for the specific list because there will be consumers of this list who would want to look at it and get some value from it, like the top restaurants in a city or um, a list of reputable um, publishers like an ad chain or in civil its case like a list of ethical newsrooms. Um, so it, it differs, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a very broad, broad topic as well, because a lot of people have been writing about it, researching and producing code for it, um, from like talking about subjective TCRs, which is the, the information that needs to be allowed in is not necessarily clear to objective TCRs where it's like easy to evaluate, um, to different ranking and layer systems, how is the list ranked? And so they're, they're just like a, it's also a very broad topic. I, th I think um, there are definitely a few that are in production uh, currently. Um, so it's just easy, uh, interesting to see what's being used and how it's being used currently. I think it's just, you have now this open economy that's happening and just seeing how people are using it, it's very interesting. So could you describe then the different forms that token created registries can take and the way that people are using them in applications? The, the, there are different ways and forms it can take. Um, primarily, people have experimented in ways in how the voting happens. Um, 
it's like if you want to be an applicant, how are people going to decide whether you should be allowed in or not? Um, to also how is the information is ranked once you're inside. Um, there's different variations of that. But I don't think any of these have been implemented in a very, like the more complicated versions haven't been implemented yet. I think only the sort of sim simpler versions have been, which is just you apply to be in and you're either in or you're out. There's no additional variation of it. So in Foam, they have a TCR for points of interest on the global map. Um, so people say like, hey, I think, you know, look here, here's the Brooklyn Br Bridge, or hey, look, it's um, it's Table Mountain. Um, so it's it's a way to annotate a map and produce a valuable list as a result. Um, and what's interesting about that was just, just seeing how people are using it, because a, a TCR thrives on the fact that there, there needs to be disputed content, um, because that's what produces value for the token, because the curators will come in and then vote either in or out this, this application. Um, it's like, it's like, you know, the question of like, are we going to classify what is green? It's like, it's going to be a simple problem. Thus, well, I'm saying simple problem might be a lot more complex than I know, but uh, it, that is that is an example where one is like you don't necessarily need a TCR to classify which objects are green. Um, so it thrives on having disputed information. In the case of foam, there's been interesting examples where there have been territorial disputes. Um, so there was like an island between South Korea and Japan where there's been different foam users which have um, say like, no, this is actually territory of Japan. And the other one says, no, it's actually territory of South Korea. And then there needs to be a dispute. And then the foam token holders needed to vote which one is which. So uh, it's quite interesting in that sense, um, where it's been used. That's interesting. And, and so I wanted to get to actual sort of applications of, uh, of TCRs. And, and it's true that, yeah, foam, I and mean, we had foam on, uh, I guess, probably about a year ago. Uh, that it, it, it constitutes this registry of points of interest that were curated by people. I, I never really thought of it that way until now. But it's so with regards to that that Japan uh, and South Korea example, that of course, you know, that that's counts as, I guess, a signal, but that doesn't actually solve the dispute over who owns the land. They're like, you know, marine tankers uh, will solve that dispute if it comes down <laughs> yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I wanted to bring it back to to an example that's kind of near to me. And so I use TripAdvisor quite a bit uh, to figure out where I'm going to eat out, right? Like, so when I'm in a new city or when I'm in any city pretty much and I want to decide what restaurant I want to go to, uh, I like trust TripAdvisor pretty much not with my life, but I'm really picky about restaurants and I definitely go to TripAdvisor to like make sure that my day doesn't end badly um, with regards to like my satisfaction towards a meal. So when I go there and, and, and I see like Jade Magic Walk in Frankfurt, I know that like that's going to be the best Chinese restaurant in Frankfurt, for instance. And I recommend that restaurant, by the way, to anyone who's in Frankfurt. Um, so, but but there's a whole like, there's a whole other set of uh, mechanisms that go into play into creating a highly successful list like TripAdvisor. So obviously there's the incentive mechanism for people to curate that list. And in the case of a centralized list, I think people shouldn't assume that there are no incentives. The incentive is the list itself. So if yeah. lists like TripAdvisor and you know Google Maps and like other such communities that have amass like a, a large amount of people that are you know, continuously improving the list exists. It's not because there are no incentives like monetarily that people want these things to exist. So they, and they also want to participate. And I think there's like, there's this, this um, desire to participate in things and, and to, to sort of create this, this thing that people have. Um, and I'm sure we could come up with other examples, but there's also the, the amount of money that has gone into marketing this list and so all the venture capital that it um true advisor has raised and invested in marketing and invested in outreach to restaurants and, and like all these different things so 
you know, looking at foam, it seems to be a similar type of example than um, than to TripAdvisor. But I mean, I don't know how many users they have, but I, I, I doubt that that would scale to that extent without that that sort of like jolt of capital to to bootstrap this network effect. Are are token created lists you know relevant to this type of use case in the end? Is this sort of like where we should think that things will go, or are they more relevant for use cases that you know don't require such massive network effects, and maybe we just need sort of like signaling mechanisms, and maybe perhaps in the aggregate uh, they form like a, a some some yeah. larger, higher level signal. You know, on the surface, I think one could say like it it is it makes sense, but I think there's there's a few things here that makes it different i think and i think token curated registries are a fit for a different class of sort of lists so to speak um and so in the case of something like TripAdvisor, i mean like 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 we can see it, it exists right like there, there, there didn't need to be additional incentives like you said the list itself is the reason why people are willing to contribute their time and effort to do reviews um they get benefit from it and we participate in sharing our reviews about certain places. So there is an existing set of benefits that make this work already in the same way that Wikipedia also works. Um, I, I think in a context of list for reviews, like restaurants or places or travel related things, I think the, the value where a decentralized list could be meaningful is that um, there's not necessarily confidence that this list would always remain reputable. So in the case of TripAdvisor and other rating systems, we know that there are people that have built bots to submit reviews um, that does sort of produce a more um, or poison the list in some sense. So we do know that we could see these things and relatively trust it good enough that it's okay, but we're not 100% sure whether we should trust it fully and so for now it's just it's good enough it's good enough but the problem is when it could it potentially start deteriorating and then there is no other list like we have to go then reinvent and there's like a large social cost involved because this list was maintained by a centralized entity so i think it's valuable there but i think for me personally token curated registries are are interesting more so when one asks the question what are ways in which we are coordinating now, which is difficult to do, um, and could list a uh, sort of decentralized list be a way to achieve that? Um, so I think token reg registers in a new set of applications is what's going to be more interesting because the way I see it is building lists for something is a form of self-regulation. Like we are curating lists for value for us and thus we're saying these are better than others. So we're saying these restaurants are good, these are not. Thus we're kind of like self-regulating our worldview. So, but self-regulation works. We, we know that is the case, but it stops working when it's the economy is too big. It's like um, the economy for that list is, becomes too big. Um, and that's where we're in this weird chasm where it's like we can't, properly self-regulate on certain things. Thus, we kind of like ask the government or nation states to help us regulate those class of problems, which is harder for people to self-regulate on, just because it is becomes easier for capture, easier to bribe, um, because the economy is different. So it's like, it's a set of problems which exist between self-regulation and the nation state. Like every, everywhere in between, I think TCRs could be valuable. Because the one thing is, well, TCRs work in anonymity. Like, you don't have to say who the token holders are. So whatever those class of problems are, I think is interesting. And the jury is out for me, where, like, whether there, there are actually those kind of problems or not. And I think that, that's, that to me is the more interesting space to explore. Like, what are we ways in which it's difficult to coordinate now to create lists that we think could be valuable here? And uh, it's still an open-ended question. Simon, could you give an example of a TCR that would be valuable, like a con concrete example? So, I mean, th it is, this gets into like weirder territory. Um, so so I, I came up with one a while back, and this was based on Cape Town had a drought, right? A very, very bad drought, and we were basically going to run out of water. And what happened as a result is the way 
Cape Town itself managed to save itself from from drought was a lot of it was social pressure. Um, you know, if there was this joke going around at the time, which was you don't go home with someone uh, if they flush their toilet more than once a day. It was a joke, right? So it's like there was this social pressure. Um, people would point out restaurants that were using too much water and people would avoid them, um, for example. But one way that was helped was because um, there were additional metrics uh, or additional measures that were put in to also mitigate it, which is the, the city of Cape Town started introducing much higher water tariffs. Um, so it became more costly just to consume water. Um, so there were like different things that was done to ensure that it that it didn't get there. So so one way to do this was like, what if there wasn't any sort of self-regulation happening and there wasn't any government that started increasing rates and tariffs and or water rationing, then what would we have done? And one way to do this is say, you start making it profitable for people to be behave in a way that is beneficial for that people that is hard to coordinate on. And that's like tragedy of the commons type problems. Like you're saying to people, look, don't overuse the commons that we all use for our cows to graze on. And so the concept of like something like water supply being scarce is you tell people, look, you, if, if you are in a TCR, you can get this label that tells you that you are a valuable person in the community that saves water but the community needs to validate that they need to go like simon is simon is using water fine like we believe that is the case but if it's tied to a bonding curve it means that if there's more incentive for people to protect the scarce resource the price would go up so this the price of the label would go up more and more as the more valuable it becomes to protect the scarce resource. So there would be this interplay where people would say, we're using the commons now because it's cheap to use the commons. But now that the supply of the commons have decreased such that it's expensive, we need to not protect the commons. And so you have this counter wedge, which is a label, which a reputational label becomes more valuable, which classifies people as good commons users. And so there's always this market, this interplay between people saying, I need to be a part of this TCR that that labels me as a valuable participant. And if I actually do this in a manner that is an early adopter of, of environmental um, measures to protect the environment, then I will, be, I will actually make a profit. I can make a profit from being good to the commons. And so I don't have to give up my profits from using the commons. I can actually get a profit from becoming a part of a game that makes it profitable to be, be a part of a people that's protecting the commons. And so, that is the class of problems where it's like, it's not self-regulation because self-regulation doesn't stop the person from going and just getting some water, but you're making it profitable for people to protect the commons. So it makes people self-interested behavior to go and actually protect the commons, but it's not the government forcing you to do so. So it's this chasm of class of problems where it's, it's hard to coordinate, it's a tragedy of the commons type thing, but you're making it profitable for people to attain a certain reputational label. But obviously like it, it, it there's still so many questions about an idea like that, like whether it's actually doable in practice or not. But that, that is the sort of direction of thinking that I was, when I think about those class of problems, like what are things that it is hard to coordinate on that is not self-regulation and it's not the government doing it. And that is where economic coordination can become useful. We are building these new kind of crypto economic coordination tools. That's a very interesting example. <laughs> so, so essentially, there is this TCR. There are the curators of the TCR. So the, what is the registry here? The registry is a list of people that consume water wisely or something like that. Yes, yeah. That's the list. And there's a group of people that's making the list. And entry to that group of people is determined by this bonding curve, this idea we covered previously. Yes, yeah. So, like, you have to buy some water-wise tokens to be able to apply to be a part of this TCR. And so, if you're going to be late to be regarded as someone that's water-wise, it's going to be very costly for you as well. So, if you're an early adopter of being water-wise, and you think this community is valuable, you would apply early on to show this reputational label to others. Um, and so, that's why it becomes, you make it a profitable action when it's necessary to have that label. 
it, it is it is sort of what you're doing is like you're creating basically very strong shelling points for people that is out of a local maximum or local minimum where people are caught in you know it's like saying like look you don't have to coordinate around these things there's actually a new sort of way for us to coordinate that improves everyone's outcomes so i care about being in that list being water wise because there's a social payoff yeah right so when i'm interacting with my friends and all i can say that i am part of this it's list and self regulation would work there when the community is small enough such that everyone knows everyone like then you don't need this game but in a context like a city like if i go to a restaurant and the restaurant says we only want water wise patrons right i won't be able to prove to them that unless someone has graded me as a water wise person and so that's why this economic game is useful for ways beyond self regulation that's yeah, so, yeah that, food for a, thought <laughs> food for so there are many implementations of tcs right there was this ad chain there's things of foam civil which implementation of TC, tcr are you bullish about because of the fact that there is still sort of uncertainty about how this value is communicated like once you have a list that's produced you actually have to go to people and say hey this is a usable list because like if you have the list of the best restaurants in the world but no one's going to see it it's not going to be valuable so I, I, that's why it's hard sometimes to have like a list of reputable publishers in the context of ad chain because you actually need advertisers to come look at this list and say this is a great list of publishers they they won't defraud me right so there's not a economic it's hard to measure the economic loop between the people consuming the list so tcrs to me that actually have that economic loop in there measurable in a measurable ways i think is more interesting um but those kind of tcrs happen more at the protocol level implementations but i i mean ocean originally had that as part of their white paper uh like a very base level tcr uh but i think they pulled it out but otherwise it's it's hard to know i think i think i still think tcr is for like interesting community member management is a good way because um people would use the token to signal being a part of it and i think that's one of the reasons why foam is also, also sort of succeeding in their tcr because it attracts a community of cartographers and if you're a cartographer who has a foam token and you meet another cartographer who has a foam token you're like wow let's be friends <laughs> yeah before we wrap up, I wanted to talk about this experiment that you conducted recently um, called uh, This Art is Always for Sale, uh, or This Artwork is Always for Sale, rather. Uh, can you tell us why you did this? What was the goal here? Like, what, what did you hope to achieve or learn with this experiment? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, as you might have heard during the whole show so far i've always been interested in the creative arts and new economics and a few months back i read the book from eric posner and glenn weil on radical markets and one of the proposals in there was around a novel way to look at property rights and that is harburger tax uh, which is essentially once you own an asset you have to always specify a sale price and on that specified sale price that you put you have to pay some tax on it. So that means if you own the asset, you can put it up as a value of five bajillion dollars or whatever, because then you have to pay tax on five bajillion dollars. Um, so that incentivizes people to price their assets in a more reasonable manner. Um, but obviously the trade-off is anyone can buy it from you at any point in time. So that was like the, a very simple concept to me that was very interesting which I thought could be used in new ways. So I, I did a lot of, uh, wrote a long blog post on the usage of radical markets in the arts, which took some of these ideas and said, what if we could do this? What if we could do that? And one of them was, you know, this artwork is always on sale, became this artwork is always on sale. So the premise for me was just to say, here's an NFT, a collectible, it represent an, uh, represents an artwork, um, and this artwork will always be on sale. And so the goal was just to say, hey, look, no one has experimented with this kind of property rights before on the blockchain and um, the art market is notorious for being interesting and different um, but it's also a very um, insular market like the art market is very sort of self-referential about themselves um, you know that 
they the idea of the art auction is very specific you know um and in this case there is an always on auction there's no sort of christie's that's going to put a auction for this artwork because it's always on sale um so that's one of the first ideas I had, like, let me just put it out there. And the artwork itself would be self-referential to the fact that it's always on sale, just to prove a point, to just put this idea out there and say, let's see what people think. Um, so I launched it about 20 days ago. Um, and it's been interesting to see the response. Um, it, it start, the sale price started at zero. So I, I didn't put up some initial value. Um, someone bought it set the price for $40, someone bought it for $40 and it set the price to $16,000. Then someone bought it for $16,000 and then put up the price at 100. It's now still the same person valued at $130,000 about. So this artwork's always on sale and it's currently valued at $130,000. Now what the interesting thing about this is, is I have now been earning in perpetuity the past 20 days on this value that has been specified. So I've earned about like two ether about, so like a few hundred dollars, um, just by the fact that this artwork is always on sale. So it, it, it's just an interesting way to think about collectibles, artwork, using blockchain and novel property rights, and then seeing what the world thinks about it, including the blockchain world, the art world. I've had art curators come to me and say, like, this is super interesting. People in the blockchain space have said it's quite interesting. And there's been a lot of discussions, good feedback, critique as well. I mean, this is not going to be for everyone, but it's just a new way to explore. What types of critiques have you received? I'm curious about that. I mean, it, the, it goes into general critique about the property model in general, which is like, you're not technically an owner. Um, you're, you're basically like renting the artwork and keeping it. And then anyone can just take it from you at any point in time at your specified sale price. So um, it brings into question whether this is a good model for art or not, um, especially digital art. It's not going to work for traditional art like right no it would only work for in. something digital where the where the asset itself could be where the value of the asset Transfer. or the, the proprietor could be not the not the value but the, the 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 actual ownership of the asset could be transferred exactly and so that's why I've, i was like very explicit in the language that i used um i, I try to not use the word owner uh, i just use the word patron um, and, and it's supposed to represent a patronage model, which is while I'm holding the digital artwork, I'm actually supporting artists at the same time. In this case, it's me. Um, so it, it is supposed to represent sort of stewardship or patronage. Um, and it would then allow the artist to also earn in perpetuity for the art that they have created in the past. And with it, I asked a lot of questions like, you know, would this change the behavior between the collector and the artist? Um, does the, the, does it change various things the way I think about art essentially? Um, but yeah, the, the critiques have mainly been about like, look, like I, I don't want to own art that someone can take away from me, so I, I don't want to participate. Have you thought about ways in which uh, one could use this for I don't know funding content creation, for instance, like a podcast? <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I totally think that it's it's possible. Um, it because it, here's another way to think about it. Um, I, I was thinking about in the context of CryptoKitties, right? Where, you, look, a lot of people played CryptoKitties and now they they just have a bunch of digital cats collecting dust somewhere. Like they, they're not necessarily participating actively anymore. But if there's someone else somewhere in the world going like, damn, I really want that cat, but you're not selling it and there's no way for me to actually get it anymore, then they can take it off your hands for a small price. You just have to set a sale price, right? So it seems to me in certain asset classes on a blockchain, it could be more meaningful for people to say like, look, if you opt into this model, like this is the way we can, we can do this. Then the revenue that's generated from people paying this price to keep the assets could go towards various people in the ecosystem that have created value, like the artists, the developers. Um, you know, what if Axiom Zen actually makes money from this kind of model instead of charging for the exchange fees? Um, so there's a different bunch of ways and different participants can earn revenue from it. And it is a possible model for a podcast as well. You know, create collectibles that people want to create that's related to Epicenter. Like, let me uh, buy and sell a Sir Sebastian bobblehead on the blockchain. And I can just, <laughs> while I hold it, I'm paying patronage towards the podcast. <laughs> well, I'll have to consider that. <laughs> and 
given that I, I'm building, like I, I've built a Cosmos validator, it could be used for validator slots because like there's only 100 yeah. of them. And yeah. we have one of them. So if we put a sale price on it, somebody can come and replace us on that slot, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually really interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean like this model seems to be that people who value that position or that thing, the the highest will end up owning the thing. Yeah. It is, I mean, the, the, the original premise was that this kind of property model works best for things, um, as it said in the book, ought to be owned in the commons, right? So it's, it, is, it is things that aren't supposed to be held and then kept off the market. It, it's not supposed to create monopolies. And I think that's, that's where it's kind of interesting. And whether that relates to art or not, I'm not sure. And that, that's what we will still see. Um, but there's diff different interesting places where this could be useful. I mean, it's not going to be used for something like ENS, for example, because you're building a value under a brand and it's someone that just takes your brand. It's like, it's pointless. Like you, you, you lose all value in doing it like that. Well, with that, uh, Simon, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. It's been uh, really fascinating to dive into uh, bonding curves and TCRs. Uh, sorry, I was calling it t t token created lists for most of the episode, but <laughs> yeah, token created registries, it's probably better, et cetera. Yeah. So thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you very much. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.